Hey everyone, super excited to be up here, but uh, got a lot to go through tonight. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. Um, got a little bit of an intro for you. Uh, so, you know, I don't get to do this very often. So that means this message will start off with one day I got married. So got married. Uh, and there were many people at this wedding that helped me become the person I am today, uh, but there are a few that I want to quickly draw your attention to. Uh, in the next slide, we see some guys. So the first guy right here, his name is Daniel Joyner. His name is Booney. Now, I met Booney my freshman year at the Dub. Uh, he was running a, a ministry called BCM, and he mentored me uh, after I graduated, and eventually he married us, obviously. And the next uh, couple guys are... Alex and Hunter, who became my very first small group ever while I was at UNCW. Um, they were my best friends. They were my first roommates I ever had. And Hunter became my best man. Um, the fourth person I met is on the next slide, and that would be Shane. Shane Hartley, right here, smiling ear to ear as he always does. Uh, he mentored me while I was at college. So all those four years, uh, he was with me and he actually brought me into his home and I spent time with his kids, spent countless hours uh, on campus with him. Uh, and he taught me a lot and I grew greatly with him and uh, he had to be there for the wedding. Uh, the next person that you see is obviously Caroline. She's the one in the white. Um, I met her my freshman year. When I met her, uh, she was uh, talking in front of a large crowd of college students, and she was talking to them about her testimony. And as soon as I laid eyes on her for the very first time, in that instant, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that she was totally hot. So, <laughs> so I knew she was totally hot, um, but seriously, she's my best friend, and we learn and grow together every single day day. And uh, the sixth person I did not meet, uh, but met in 2016, that fellow right there, you might know him, his name's Garrett. He's one of my closest friends and obviously a close fellow worker in Christ. And he and I have spent many, many hours uh, in vans going from Tennessee to Georgia to Kentucky, as you guys know. But I've definitely spent way, way, way many more hours uh, learning from his teaching over the years. So a quick recap. Uh, so We'll talk about, uh, the reason I bring all this up is because these are all people who I've been in small groups with, who have mentored me, discipled me, I've lived life with, and I've obviously learned and grown with. Um, so we'll talk more about those specifics tonight, those outlets of learning tonight. Um, but first, a quick recap. So through this series, Foundations for Flourishing, we've learned about important spiritual disciplines that help us live rightly. Uh, so far, we've learned about how to hear from God, how to lean into God, and how to live for his kingdom. Uh, but tonight, we'll wrap up the series by looking at how we learn and grow in the kingdom of God. Uh, before we do that, will you please pray with me? Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you for the privilege it is to read from your word and to be able to be encouraged by it. I ask, Father, that you, uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, help influence the hearts in this room to change and transform and challenge them. Uh, Father, I pray all of this in your son's holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. amen. All right. So before answering our main question, uh, I want to focus and remember what the kingdom of God is. I believe doing that will remind us of an important truth that we need uh, to firmly grasp our answer to our question. Uh, so the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, was obviously, arguably, one of the most important topics that Jesus ever talked about during his ministry. And believe it or not, the kingdom of heaven, that phrase, can actually be understood in uh, many different ways depending on its context. Uh, but we're just going to look at one real quick. And that's based out of Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, uh, which says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So in this context, the key to understanding the meaning of the phrase kingdom of heaven is understanding it in light of the future and the present. Now, it's a concept I'm sure some, if not most of you, are already familiar with, referred to as the already, but not yet. But in this context, I think a simple way to define the kingdom of heaven is God's future reign and his present reign. So 
Uh, for those in Christ, we know that God is currently preparing to reign with us in the future. Uh, that's gonna be fresh, it's gonna be complete, it's gonna be new, it's gonna be perfect, just like Matt was talking about. It'll literally be heaven and it'll truly be awesome. Uh, but the kingdom of heaven is more than just God's future reign, it's also a present one. So in this passage, when Jesus says at the beginning, the time is fulfilled, what he's saying is he's expressing that the preparation for his arrival was complete. Uh, he was saying that all the applicable prophecies have been fulfilled, including John the Baptist coming and going before him. All the prep work was done. Next, when he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's saying that the time for God to reign in a new way was coming soon. And that new way is obviously through Jesus himself, his life, his death, his resurrection. And part of the new way is also through the coming of the Holy Spirit, who would come later as a helper. What I want us to remember and take away from this is that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. It was. Jesus was going to die for us, and the Holy Spirit was going to come. But those things have already come to pass. Jesus has died, and he's risen and now he lives and the Holy Spirit now lives within those of us who have placed our faith in him. So that means what? It means that we are now his kingdom and he is presently reigning over us today. So how should we respond as we look toward our answer to our question? How do we respond? The bottom line is simple. Believers, we're called to live a life that reflects that truth, right? That we are the kingdom of God today does Jesus truly reign in your life? If he isn't, don't wait to make him your Lord because we are his kingdom again today. Uh, so what we just spent time doing, uh, a couple minutes doing, was remembering that foundational truth, which is his kingdom is not only in the future, but also today. I believe that foundation will motivate us to firmly grasp how to learn and grow in the kingdom that's very present. So, uh, before we look at how we learn and grow, let's first talk about the why. Why do we do that? So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. You guys know it. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you until the end of the age. So, the answer to why we learn and grow is probably what you'd expect it to be. It's because that's what Jesus commanded us to do. The Great Commission is clear. We are called to make disciples and to teach. And with a little wisdom and a little discernment, we can discern that to fulfill the Great Commission, we first must be discipled and taught. Many of you know that the word disciple means learner. And we learn more about this in Acts 11, 26, which says, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So a little bit of background here. So the church in Antioch was faithful. They were really faithful. So faithful that the church in Jerusalem caught wind of it. And they were so excited about that news that they sent Barnabas. They were like, Barnabas, get over there. So he got to Antioch and he got there. And he was like, whoa, this is great. Let's get Paul over here. So he left Antioch, went to go find Paul, brought Paul so that they could both teach the church that was faithful. So the first thing I want to note is that the many disciples, the learners of Jesus in the early church were taught by Paul and Barnabas for a full year. The second thing we note is that for the very first time in history, the disciples of Jesus are called Christians. And I believe there's a good reminder here for us that there's a distinction between being called a Christian and actually being a disciple of Jesus. And I want to be clear, people who are called Christians should not be called should only be called so because they're first disciples of Jesus. Not the other way around. Acts 11 doesn't say that the Christians were first called disciples, does it? So, no. The label Christian is just that, a label. Here's a warning. Let's not fall into the temptation of labeling ourselves without first being true disciples. So, 
the reason why we must learn and grow for the kingdom of God. And you can throw that up there, JT. We're called to be disciples of Jesus. The reason why we must learn and grow for the kingdom of God is because the Great Commission can't be fulfilled by people merely labeled Christian. It can't. It can only be fulfilled by people who make disciples because they were first discipled. And it, they can only teach when they have been taught first. So now let's get to the meat and potatoes and answer how do we learn and grow for the kingdom of God. And to do that, we'll spend the majority of the rest of our time looking at 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verses 5 through 10. And to give some context, Peter is, uh, he is writing to the church which is facing persecution and affliction, uh, and he is reminding them of their call to holiness despite these dire circumstances. Uh, he encourages them to embrace unity and also reminds them of the hope that they have in Jesus in the future at the end of the letter. So let's go ahead and read uh, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 10. It says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So let's start exploring. Well, uh, I'm sorry. At the beginning of this, we catch a glimpse of the very first way that we learn and grow for the kingdom, and that is to have humility. So let's start exploring humility by rereading the start of verse five. I'm gonna go verse by verse on this. So get ready. Verse five says, likewise you who are younger. That's it. Likewise you who are younger. Now I, I know it can be slightly annoying for you guys to hear constantly about how young you are. But trust me, adulting hits hard and it hits fast. So I remember when I was in college and uh, I was so stressed out over schools and exams and getting up early and staying up late and having two jobs. And, but then all that went away. I graduated. I graduated and all the school stuff went away and it was just me and my girlfriend Caroline and still had my jobs. And I went on a mission trip to Ecuador and I went to Mexico to hang out with the fam and I was just floating. I was just floating, but then got my first big boy job. Got my first big boy job, a couple months go by, we get engaged, and within about a year and some change, I had a brand new bride, I had a marriage, I had more responsibilities for my job, bosses demanding more, jobs getting harder, got an apartment, obviously I already got married, got, said that already, honeymoon season is over, Got new bills, got to pay insurance, you know, got more responsibility, right? I have a marriage to look after. I got a bribe to look after now. Adulting can come faster than you think. So I praise the Lord for your youth. That's the first thing I want you to take away. It isn't a bad thing. You realize that you're all near an age where the majority of older people look at you and understand that you don't have it all figured out. I would argue that most older people that are wise look at you guys and they're like, we don't expect you to have it all figured out. Things like you wanna, what you want to major in, what you want to do in life, if you even want to go to college. I don't have that anymore. I wish Garrett was here because I'd look at him and he'd agree. He doesn't have that anymore. We, don't, we ain't got that anymore. We have people that look to us and have more adult, more serious expectations. People look at us differently. But your youth and the lack of older adult expectations is especially freeing if you embrace humility. That's what this is all about. If you embrace humility now that you're young, you will find opportunities to learn everywhere you look, all around you. You can learn about anything and everything. And this is especially true when it comes to your faith. <coughs> Let's keep going. Second part of verse five says, likewise you who are younger, be 
subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. And our first takeaway under humility is humble yourselves before others. We're called to be subject to the elders, humble towards others, and this is a problem. This is a problem because we are naturally prideful because of sin. That's why being humble is our natural enemy. And it doesn't help that we're judgmental. We always think we know better than most other people, don't we? But remember, Jesus says he himself is gently, gentle and lowly in heart. In Matthew eleven twenty nine. He calls us to learn from him and to find rest for our souls for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. This, of course, means that he will help us be humble and put away our pride because he is the perfect example of humility. So let's finish out this first section through verse seven. We're going. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Here we're introduced to our second takeaway. Humble yourselves before God. Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So we can grow in the knowledge of God, but we first need to fear him. And that doesn't happen until we experience salvation. The fear is like how you would encounter like an African lion, right? giant lion, it's powerful, it's majestic, but at the same time, it's powerful, and dangerous, and capable. That should be our heart's posture towards God, one of reverence and fear and humility. Are you feeling prideful? Easy way to get rid of that. Remember that he made everything, including you, out of dust. Physically, we are nothing more than dust, and to dust we will return. That's sobering. According to this section that we just read, the main reason why we should humble ourselves now is because he will give us grace, he will exalt us in the future, and he cares about our anxieties today. Did you catch that? He cares. He won't let you down like people will. When you are facing anxiety and you go to somebody, those people aren't always perfect in the response. Sometimes they fumble over their words. Sometimes they don't even know what to say. God isn't like that. He is perfect to care for you and your anxieties. So he will also, Jesus will also, I'm sorry, living this out, living this out, being humble toward God will help us be exponential, exponentially better at living out humility towards others. It's also something to keep in mind. So to summarize, be humble. This isn't easy to do because of our pride. We have that natural tendency to be prideful but he is our perfect example of how to be humble. He's gentle and lowly, and he will help us to learn and be obedient and to follow his commands, which according to 1 John 5, are not burdensome. And this brings us to the next way that we learn and grow, which is to be watchful and stand firm. So, verse eight says, be sober-minded, be watchful. First takeaway here is be on guard against sin and temptation. Here we're introduced to a concept I think a lot of us read about but don't tend to dwell on very much. There are many instances in scripture where sleeping Christians are called to wake up and to arise. I think one of the most famous ones uh, is Jonah, who's in the belly of the ship that's being ripped apart by the storm after he decided to flee from God. And the captain comes down to the belly of the ship where Jonah's sleeping and says, why are you asleep? Wake up and call out to your God so that he might remember us. He tells him to pray for salvation. But I think one of the more even famous ones is actually when Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And what happens? Takes him to pray and says, stay awake. Stay here. Remain here. Stay awake and pray so that you may not fall into temptation. What happens? He comes back three separate times to find his disciples sleeping. So while Jesus is about to be handed over to be crucified, blood sweat dripping down, his closest friends are napping. What this passage and many others like it are alluding to is our 
need to remain spiritually awake. But I, we need to stay on guard and watchful, aware that the temptations are always a threat to our holiness. Proverbs 9.9 9 says, teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. We need to pursue righteousness with everything we have because if we give into these temptations, which are relentless, the outcome is pretty plain. We're gonna learn nothing. So what sins are you struggling with? Whatever they are, ask God to help you overcome them by the power of his spirit. Ask him for help, remaining on high alert at all times and to not neglect the dangers of sin. Let's keep reading. Hey, so be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Second takeaway is to Beware, you gotta beware of the adversary and resist him. To do that, we have to have a healthy familiarity with who the enemy is. We have to be aware of his strategy, don't we? We don't see this more clearly anywhere but other than in John 8, which says, there is no truth in him. He is a liar indeed. He is the father of lies. With this in mind, we need to be on guard against Satan's lies and what he will use against us. He, compare, he is compared to a lion that's prowling, roaring, ready to pounce. He's casting doubt into your decisions. Your decisions to follow Jesus, convincing you that your sin is too great, that you need to live a more holy life before even considering salvation. He's lying to you about your ability to do anything worthwhile with your life. He's lying to you about the value of your life, that it has no meaning we need to resist him. He's lying to you because he's a liar. That's what he does. But how do we do that? How do we resist him? We need to be able to know the truth so we can easily distinguish the lies, don't we? We need to be firm in our faith. So third takeaway. We keep reading. Pretty short. Resist him. Firm in your faith. Pretty clear. Standing firm in our faith will help us resist Satan and his lies. And the more firm our faith is, the easier it'll be to spot them. When you're driving at night, turn your high beams on, right? Who, who turns their high beams on? Oh, I want to know. Me and Michaela turn our high beams on. And Jamie. And Cassidy. And Cassidy. And Brian sometimes. You need to get them replaced then. <laughs> so... High beams, what do they do? They allow us to see clearly, don't they? With high beams on, we can see the curves coming up ahead. We can see the deers on the side of the road. We can see hazards. Why? Because we can see them clearly. We have visibility. Firmness in our faith is the same exact way. It's the same thing. With it, you can spot the counterfeit of lies before they get to you. But how can you be watchful and stand firm without knowing what your faith is? Understanding what you believe is our fourth takeaway. On our path to being watchful and standing firm, we must also recognize the importance of understanding what we believe in. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, There will be imposters who deceive because they have been deceived, but that we are to firmly stand and firmly grasp what we have learned. How can you stand firm in what you haven't learned? Study the scriptures. Spend time here to know who God is and who he's called you to be. Let's strive to understand our faith and the truths that he's called to live out. Ephesians 4.25, as we wrap up this section, says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Yeah, we're called to understand the truths that we believe in, but it doesn't stop there. We're also called to speak those truths to one another, not just because it's a good thing, but because we're all connected by the blood of Jesus and we're all members one of another. So being watchful and standing firm is not something we're called to do alone. This brings us to the next way we learn and grow in the kingdom, which is to embrace community. Embrace community. 
Let's read the next section of verse 9. It says, Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Remember, the context here, Peter's writing to the church that's being persecuted, right? We, we know that the ancient church, based on this, needed to be reminded that they were not alone. They needed to hear that the same persecutions and afflictions that they were experiencing were also being experienced by their brothers and sisters around the world. But, but why? why? Why is that important? Why do they need to hear that? It's because... One of the lies Satan will use against you is that you can do life on your own. He'll try to convince you that your problems aren't worth mentioning or sharing, that the sin you committed is so shameful and so embarrassing that you shouldn't share it with somebody because they won't show you grace or understand. Men, that you need to just man up and figure it out on your own alone. But the truth is we're not alone and we don't have to face things by ourselves. We are created for community. But before we look at that, let's acknowledge that we can learn and grow in personal ways. That's our first takeaway here. We can learn personally. God himself teaches us. We see this in Ephesians 5.1, which calls us to be imitators of God. 1 Peter 2.21 says, Christ was an example that we should follow in his steps. We also learn and grow in personal study and prayer. Psalm 1.1 says, Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates both day and night. Colossians 1.9-10 says, Paul prayed for the church in Colossae to be filled with spiritual wisdom and understanding so they could increase in the knowledge of God. James 1.5 says, Tell, it tells us to ask God for wisdom without reproach and it will be given. So yeah, there are many opportunities to learn and grow on our own. But the truth still remains. We are still designed to learn and grow together. That's our second bullet point. First outlet for learning is the church. <coughs> Romans 12, 4 through 5. We read about how we are one body in Christ and we're members one of another. I believe this is most beautifully depicted in Acts chapter two, which says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those that were being saved. First thing I wanna note is how wonderful the togetherness of the early church was. What would the church look like today if it followed the example depicted here on display of fellowship? It'd be amazing. The second thing I want to note is that it's not a mistake. If you can go back to the first part of, it's not a mistake that the very first thing that the early church did after being established by the Holy Spirit was they devoted to them, themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's not a mistake they did that first to learn who Jesus was and what the church was meant to be. We're called to do the same. We gather on Sunday mornings for this very reason. We're here right now for this very reason. Here at Scotts Hill, there are opportunities for basically every age group to be taught throughout the week and to learn and grow. Imagine if people came on Sunday mornings and there was no sermon for them be meaningless. The people coming who wanted to experience this kind of fellowship, having things in common, giving sacrificially, breaking bread in their homes, the increase in numbers, and most importantly, the salvations, those people would be wasting their time because true fellowship only takes place when there's a foundation of truth which must be taught. The second way we learn and grow in community is through Small groups. 
Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 reminds us that we are to stir one another up in good works and not neglect to meet as is often the practice of others. I don't know about you, but we go to a pretty big church. This is a big church. It's not a bad thing, but in a church this size, meaningful, vulnerable, intentional conversations can be hard to come by on a Sunday morning. And we know that Jesus gathered with various size groups. Sometimes it was thousands, sometimes it was smaller. But we know that the number of people who spent the most amount of time learning and growing with Jesus was 12. And 12 isn't a hard guideline for small group sizes, but small groups are meant to be small. Why? Because a smaller group gives us opportunities to have those meaningful conversations, to have those intentional discussions, and to have those vulnerable, vulnerable moments of prayer and confession. Equally as important, it helps us experience the true fellowship that we just talked about. In smaller settings, it's easier to carry out the things that we just read. My small group meets in a home every single week. We meet uh, in a couple different homes sometimes, just depends, but we always have dinner. We always break bread with one another. We always talk about the message, God's word, how we've been challenged that week. We hold each other accountable. We pray for one another. We confess sin to one another. We do all those things every single week. And I know a lot of you in this room are in small groups. Think about your small group. Think about those moments that stand out to you. Those are moments of true fellowship, aren't they? I encourage you to find a group if you don't already have one. Third way. Third way we learn and grow in community is through mentorship. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to the word, spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. This is one of many examples in scripture where we're called to learn and to go to spiritual leaders in the church and to learn from them. Paul always said, do what I do. Imitate me, imitate me. We read it all throughout his letters. The positive effect of mentorship is so globally recognized that even non-believers practice it. Why wouldn't we? Seriously, why wouldn't we do that? Discipleship and mentorship are steps to becoming mature believers. Want to know how to get a mentor? Look, what we just read, what we just read, look at the verse. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Sorry, I just realized I don't have it up there, my bad. So consider the outcome of their way of life. This is Hebrews 13, 7. Look around you. There are older, wiser men and women that go to this church that live godly lives, and you can see it. It's evident. They're open to getting to know you, spending time with you, and teaching you. I've been meeting with Matt Holland for a little over a year now. And he and I meet as regularly and as frequently as we possibly can. We meet, try to meet every week. And we go through scripture. We read books together. Uh, we hold each other accountable. More for me. And he teaches me. And I learn from him. And I've grown in this year plus that I've been with him. Nathan Lim, he and I have been meeting for the past few weeks. We're going through Romans, which you know is my favorite book. We're going through it verse by verse, aren't we? Verse by verse. And we talk about hard things and we learn and grow together. I just asked Matt a year and a half ago. I said, Matt, do you know anybody that can mentor me here at Scotts Hill? And he said, yeah, I, I can do it. Nathan just asked me, hey, can you do this? I was like, of course. Who are you imitating? I encourage you to find a mentor to imitate. The fourth and last way we learn and grow in community is through friendship. I like the way John ends his letter. This is 3 John, 3 John, 3 John. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. The Apostle John understood 
that our relationship to one another as members, as the body of Christ, is not meant to be mechanical. We read more about this in John 15 when Jesus calls his disciples his friends because they do what he commanded them to do. Our friendships are meant to help us learn and grow. A great example of this is last year, my friend Alex, who I talked to you guys about at the very beginning, one of my groomsmen, uh, he came to visit Caroline and I, and we had dinner with him and his girlfriend, and we had a great time. But after he left, I, I noticed that he wasn't walking with the Lord. So what did I do? I picked up the phone. I called Hunter. I was like, Hunter, just spent time with Alex, not walking with the Lord. We got to pray for him. We prayed for him. And time went on. That was last year. Last month, Alex calls me out of the blue. He's like, hey, man, how you doing? I just wanted to let you know that I rededicated my life to Christ. This is where I'm walking. This is where I'm walking now. This is who I'm walking with. This is what my church situation looks like. It wasn't just, he didn't just stop there. He said, can you please give me Hunter's number so I can call him and tell him to? And we're seeing Hunter next month as we do every single year when either we go to Alpharetta, Georgia to visit him and his family or they come here to visit us. I'm going to see him and get to spend time with him. Last month, I saw Shane. He and I uh, met at a dinner and we got to catch up. It's been probably a, a year, some change since I've seen him last. But it's always sweet to see him and it's always sweet to catch up. The month before that, Booney, the guy who married us, he and I, he gave me a call, ring, just to check up, check up on me. Say, hey, how you doing? Got to have you over for dinner soon. We just haven't picked a date yet. Friends are special and important. They help us learn and grow. And Proverbs 27, 10 says that a friend can sometimes be better than family on our toughest days. Spiritually invest in your friends and they will stick with you for years to come. I have proof. We'll conclude with verse 10. Verse 10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. We see that God is gracious. He promises to restore and confirm us one day in heaven, in his future kingdom. But we also see that he wants to strengthen and establish us now because we are his kingdom. Let's allow that to motivate us to learn and grow together using these spiritual disciplines that we've been talking about. Let's pray for help to embrace them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy. Father, I pray that these truths that we talked about tonight and have been talking about, that they resonate within the hearts of these students and continue to resonate in mine. Father, I ask that you continue to edify your church through the learning and growing by the use of these spiritual disciplines, Father. As we learn to hear from you, as we continue to lean into you, as we continue to live for you, Father, we pray all these things in your son's holy and precious name, Jesus, by the power of your spirit. Amen.